oh, now the general name of the Piatic Langlands correspondence, although it, this is still very much a developing area. Let me make one quick remark. I think yesterday I said that Louisa Orton was Henri Darmon's student, and that, I guess, is not the case. But um, we're going to, in the earlier th discussion, we saw this construction of an L invariant, which uses this hybrid business, where you have sort of piatic distributions on the upper, on the boundary of the piatic upper half plane, constructed by means of modular symbols, which are integrals of modular forms on the classical upper half plane. And uh, I guess the idea here is to put this um, construction into this context of the piatic Langlands correspondence, whatever that might be. So here's a brief outline of the talk. I'm going to say a little bit about what this piatic Langlands program is like without getting into too many details. And uh, in particular, then uh, in order to explain where the L invariant plays a role, uh, I'll need to define this uh, completed atoll cohomology groups of the Tower of Modular Curves. And then the last two topics are Broy duality. Broy duality is a generalization of Morita duality. So it's, again, a piatic analytic thing, generalization of the uh, relationship between distributions on the boundary of the piatic upper half plane and rigid functions on the upper half plane itself. And then we'll see how um, the Orton L invariant or the Darmon Orton L invariant fits into this picture. So, um, I mean, the Langlands correspondence, at least for GL2, is an attempt to relate Galois representation, so two-dimensional, I mean, like I said, I'm leaving everything out, but in general terms, the idea is we want to somehow find a correspondence between certain spaces of modular forms, which we can interpret representation theoretically as some sub-representation of this big space, uh, this should, yeah, of, of GL2 over the Adels, and some uh, collection of two-dimensional Galois representations. And um, this is the general attempt to generalize class field theory to non-abelian representations. And uh, it, there's, you know, it's a very, very long story. And uh, basically, this is all I think you should bear in mind about it, is that, is that the two sides of the correspondence are more, more or less Galois representations and modular forms. And there's a local version of this correspondence, which, I mean, that just is somehow the local class field theory version. And in this local correspondence, we have essentially now two-dimensional representations of the Galois group of QP bar over QP. And on the other side, we have what plays the role of the local modular forms, which turns out to be a, a class of irreducible representations of this group GL2 of QP. They're I mean, in, in non-trivial cases, these are going to be infinite dimensional representations of GL2 of QP, and uh, which are smooth. And smooth means that if you think about, if you pick a vector in your vector space V, and you think about the function on the group into the vector space where you send a, a group element G to G applied to that vector, that that function is locally constant on the group. That's what a smooth representation is. And if you'd like an example of, of such a thing, if you take, I mean, we've seen one of them, a really important one, actually. We saw the locally constant functions on P1, uh, which has GL2 acting on it by uh, the way it acts, by Mobius transformations on P1. So the locally constant functions on P1 with the GL2, sort of natural GL2 action on P1 is an example of one of these smooth representations called the Steinberg. Well, if you mod out by the trivial sub-representation, so throw out the constant function, then you would get uh, the Steinberg representation. So these have uh, at least in some way already appeared in the story. And this fact that they have appeared is kind of fundamental to why there's some connection between what's going on on the piatic upper half plane and modular forms in general. But if you look at this picture that I just described here, um, I think the thing to bear in mind is that, I mean, you can phrase this not just in complex representations, but maybe also L-adic representation of, of the Galois group of QP bar over QP. But there's a conflict between the L 
let's say, and the p of qp. And the result of that is that if you look at um, representations of the Galois group of qp bar over qp, which when you get up to the wild ramification group is very much a pro-p group, into things which are kind of L-adic or over the complex numbers, there's a limit to what you can see in those representations. And if you really want to see more of that group, you should take p-adic representations. So you should take, uh, for example, you should look at elliptic curve over qp or over q, and you should look at the action of the Galois group on the p-division points of that elliptic curve, and you get these enormous ramified uh, extension fields with Galois groups which are like GL2 of ZP or something like that. And those are a kind of representation which you can, you don't see as well if you look only at complex or elastic representations. So the, the low classical local Langlands program only it somehow a, a attempts to account for these complex or L-adic representations. And if you want to see the P-adic representations, suddenly you have a lot more to see, and you need to account for them. And the, the underlying principle for that is to expand the class of representations on the group side as well, and no longer to limit yourself to representations of GL2 of QP, where the orbit maps are locally constant, but instead to try to relate p-adic representations to more general continuous representations of this group. So like what? Well, we've seen some examples of big continuous representations of GL2 of QP, like these spaces of modular forms on the p-adic upper half plane. And that at least introduces the possibility of a, of a much richer collection of representations of the group, which could then correspond to this much richer collection of Galois representations that you have. And the, uh, so the general picture becomes trying, and as I said, I mean, it, there is no piatic local Langlands correspondence. There's just kind of a lot of ideas about what it might look like and a lot of very suggestive, suggestive examples for the group GL2 of QP. But if there were one, you could imagine, at least in the two-dimensional case, that there was some way to re relate two-dimensional p-adic Galois representations to irreducible representations of GL2 of QP on topological vector spaces. And now what you do is you allow more general functions here instead of just locally constant functions. You allow perhaps locally analytic functions, or you allow perhaps continuous functions. So that would correspond to the case where, for example, um, instead of just taking the locally constant functions on P1 over QP and thinking of the action of GL2 of QP on that space, you could take the locally analytic functions on P1 of QP and take the action of GL2 of QP on that space. Or you could take the continuous p-adic functions on the projective line over QP and look at the action of GL2 of QP on that space and from those representations hope to make a connection back to Galois representations. So here's an example, and I think the, you know, the, the Broy was probably the first person to kind of put this together into a systematic uh, way of, of relating both sides of this hypothetical correspondence between Galois representations and these uh, sort of continuous representations on the GL2 side. So here's, here's the, a little bit of, a, of the flavor of what this correspondence would look like. So take your, I mean, take a modular form of, of level n on GL2, and you have now just the local piatic Galois representation. So for example, you're looking here at the action of the Galois group of QP bar over QP on the P division points of a modular elliptic curve. That's the kind of Galois representation that we would have. So here, if f is of weight 2 and associated to an elliptic curve, then you have the action of gal qp bar over qp on, on the p-adic tape module. And there's a couple of possibilities for what can happen in that situation. If p doesn't divide the level, so the elliptic curve has good reduction there, then under, this, under the Fontaine classification of p-adic representations, you get a crystalline p-adic representation. And those are classified basically by knowledge of the p-adic Hodge weights of the representation, which 
are determined because it came from an elliptic curve, and the action of Frobenius. On, I mean, you would, in order to under to see what I'm talking about here, I'm, you would take your, uh, you would calculate the B uh, the yeah the B Chris module associated to this crystalline representation using Fontaine's theory, and you would get a vector space on which you have a Frobenius action and a filtration. And it it turns out that there the situation is constrained enough that basically the filtration is determined by the Frobenius and the weights. And so there's not a lot of data encoded in these crystalline representations. And what Broy and, I mean, conjecturally, and then Broy Berger and really Colmez showed is that they showed how to construct for each of these possible crystalline representations a irreducible Bonnock space representation of GL2 of QP. And it, this irreducible Bonnock space representation is somehow parameter, the possible ones are parametrized by the, the Frobenius data. To just say very simply what these things are, there's a smooth representation which is associated to this, uh, to this Frobenius um, under the usual, without, with, under the usual lo local Langlands correspondence. If you have a Frobenius, you can make a certain smooth representation which is what would correspond under the classical Langlands correspondence. And then you take that smooth representation and you complete it piatically. And it turns out that there's a unique piatic completion of it on which satisfies some conditions. For instance, that the group acts, preserves a norm, and um, this, the, the, the fact that the completion, so, so I guess what, without getting into the details here, the basic point is that the, the Bonnock space representation that you get is it comes from the um, local representation you would get by Langland's theory, but there's no new information in there, okay? Because the crystalline representation and the, the local part of the, the smooth representation, there's no new data. But what happens when P does divide N exactly once? So, so this is the case, for example, for P equals 11 and X naught of 11. And in that case, the local Galois representation at P is no longer crystalline, but is a slightly more general class of representations called semi-stable. And it's no longer true that if you just know the weight and the Frobenius eigenvalue on such a representation in the Fontaine classification, it's not enough to know what the representation actually is. There's one more piece of information that you need to know. And that piece of information that you need to know is the L invariant uh, associated to this representation. More precisely, it's the L invariant defined by Fontaine and Maser. I mean, essentially, that is what the Fontaine Maser L invariant is. It's a number that you can concoct out of the uh, Fontaine module, which is associated to one of these semi stable representations, which then gives you the additional information necessary to determine it. I mean, the point is that the, all of these representations have the same local Langlands component. They're all this Steinberg representation that I described before. But as Galois representations, they're different. And it's the L invariant, which is the extra piece of information. So if you think about Broy's philosophy, uh, if there is such a correspondence, and on the Galois representation theory side, it's the L invariant that you need to isolate the isomorphism class of the Galois representation. Then on the sort of representation theory side, on the GL2 side, the L invariant should be there somewhere. In the crystalline case, there's only one possible Bonnock space representation. But it must be the case that in the semi-stable case, there's a whole bunch of possible Bonnock space representations somehow parametrized by the L invariant. And the, what I'm going to talk about is how Broy showed that I mean, what happened is that he showed that, uh, that this is true um, initially, though, using global information. I mean, initially, he showed, he showed how to construct a Bonnock space, a family of Bonnock space representations parametrized by L invariants. But he could only prove they were non-zero when the L invariant happened to be the L invariant of a global modular form by means of this Orton business. And then later, through work of Colmez and others, 
they were able to show by local methods that, in fact, these representations exist for all L invariants, even if they don't happen to come from a global modular form. But I'm just going to talk about this initial work where the global modular form came in, because that's where you see the connection to the um, Darmon double integrals and all this other business. So the question is, you know, can you get the local piatic representation out of automorphic data? Or what information on the representation theory side of this correspondence is, where do you see the L invariant on the representation theory side? And so I'm going to talk about this work of Broy, which says that, that that answer is encoded in the L invariant that I talked about two days ago um, that was def defined initially by Darmon and then in higher weight uh, worked out by Orton. So now I need to give you a little bit of machinery here uh, in order to just state how this works. Uh, so um, the idea is to, I mean, everything in this business comes down to trying to construct piatic Bonnock spaces that somehow complete things that you knew about already. And so the thing that, the, the thing that you start out by doing is you, you, you construct a completed version of the sort of atal cohomology of the tower of modular curves. So what, for each open compact subgroup of GL2 of the finite Adels, you can look at this double coset space, Y of K, which is kind of a fancy version of the modular curve of level K. I mean, if you took for KL GL2 of ZL at all but, say, 1L, and at that 1L you took, let's say, the congruent subgroup of level L, then work out what this double coset space is, then you would get the modular curve, no cusp, but just the modular curve, which is kind of corresponds to the principal subgroup of level L. But you may have, it may come in, in several connected components, which uh, has significance in the sort of automorphic theory. But you should think now of, so this is just a way to, if you, as you vary the compact open subgroup K, you can basically see all the modular curves of all levels organized into a big tower. And you can look at the atal cohomology of these things. OK, this looks fancy, but it, it might be easier to think about all the modular curves organized into to a tower and pick a P and look at all of their tape modules in this tower organized into a big uh, projected distance. And I mean, you could take, comp if you took compactly supported cohomology, then you would pick up maybe some Eisenstein series terms as well. But, uh, this big space has an action of the Galois group because that's, it acts on all of these um, tape modules, if you like. Now, what we're going to do is treat one of the primes in a special way. So uh, K upper P means we do whatever we want in terms of the level for primes away from P. But at P itself, we, adjoin, we sort of take principal congruence uh, the principal congruent subgroup of level p to the r. And, <coughs> excuse me, we look at the, we organize our sequence of modular curves where we let the level in p go to infinity, but we have away from p some fixed tame level. So, you, I mean, morally speaking, this is like the tape modules of x naught of n p to the r as r goes to infinity, or x of n p to the r as r goes to infinity. And here it's a direct limit, so you can somehow think of this as the union of all the tape modules. And this is a big uh, representation for GL2 of QP, which acts on the, I mean, it, it acts on the, uh, on the right here, on, through the compact open part, I guess. I hope I'm saying this right. I get confused very easily. But it's a... Um, this is a smooth representation. So these are the actions of the HECA operators at P, basically. And it, they give you a smooth representation. And this is how you pick out the, um, the Langlands, the P, P part of the Langlands correspondence, the local one here. But what we're actually going to do instead, so this would be sort of the classical game. But instead, what we do is we take this giant space here, 
and we periodically complete it. And if you do that, well, this thing without the tensor with QP turns out to be some giant ZP module, which is like the unit ball in a piatic Bonnock space. And then we tensor it with QP, and we actually get a Bonnock space. And the group, the GL2 QP action now still becomes continuous, and we still have the action of the Hecke algebra away from P, which acted before, and we still have the Galois group acting on this thing. And you should think of this as somehow the a big space of piatic modular forms. I mean, it is basically is a giant space of piatic modular forms. And here's Broglie's theorem, which attempts to relate this to the things that we were talking about before. It's kind of hard to have any picture of this, I think, this space here as, you know, in toto. So you can try to look at pieces of it. So uh, what Broglie proves is the following theorem. You, you start with a piatic Bonnock space, so we have some extension field E of QP, on which GL2 of QP acts continuously in a way which preserves the norm on the Bonnock space. And B star is its dual, uh, continuous dual. Then you have the following isomorphism, which is really just a kind of an adjointness result. That if you look at the ways of embedding this Bonnock space, B, into this giant space of piatic modular forms in a way which compute, commutes with the GL2 of QP action, that that's isomorphic to instead taking D0, which was the space of cusps of the modular curve. It was the modular symbols thing. And looking this side here, you have, well, B dual. These are the linear functionals on B. These are the modular symbols with values in, the B, in B dual, which are invariants by the group gamma 1 twiddle p of n, which these are the groups which I defined last time. They're the matrices who have, which have, um, they look like SL2 with a congruence condition in the lower left-hand entry, but actually I think the tilde maybe means it's not SL2, but GL2. Anyway, but the entries are not integers. They have p's in the denominator. Yeah. G it's a subgroup of GL2 of QP, oh. right? B, everything here is a, uh, is a GL2 of QP module. Oh, the N, there should be an N in this, which got, which isn't, this thing was completed by fixing a tame level N and letting P go to infinity. So there's a, actually an N implicit on this side as well. I think it's just a typo. So, uh, the, the meaning of this thing is, if, if you think of this B as a local object, okay, like a local, lang the, the local component of a, of a Langlands correspondence, a local representation of GL2 of QP, and you think of this as the global thing, and you want to see how does the local thing embed into the global thing, well, you can compute it by looking at modular symbols. And this may, be, this may seem hopelessly abstract, and in certain ways it is, but in other ways it's really pretty formal. The point is, what is, I mean, how could there be such a map? How, I mean, how is this thing here related to modular symbols? This is some big H1 of all the modular curves together. And these are some cycles on the modular curve. So, I mean, in some sense, basically, you can, you can integrate elements of this against these cycles on the upper half plane. And uh, so there is a kind of a duality between this space here and this space here. And, and so somewhere down at the bottom, the modular symbols really I are in here as playing their role of paths on the upper half plane. So um, the, the point here, I guess, is the left-hand side is something which looks like it comes from the piatic Langlands picture. That is to say, it's, in, it's trying to find a sub-representation of a giant continuous GL2 of QP representation. And the thing on the right-hand side is something which we've seen already. It's a certain space of modular symbols, at least if we pick the right B. Okay, so the question is, which B are we going to stick into this picture to get something reasonable? And uh, so that's this next part of the, of the discussion where we look at ways to see how this theorem can be seen as linking Darmon's theory and, and Broglie's theory via L invariance.
So now we go back to the piatic upper half plane for a little while to talk about Broglie duality. So Broglie duality is a, an extension of Morita's duality uh, between rigid analytic forms on the upper half plane and boundary distributions. So I need a little bit of, of uh, to see where the L comes in. Actually, this was in Kieran's talk yesterday. We need the, the, the branch, we need to choose a branch of the piatic logarithm. So a branch of the piatic logarithm means we, we take log L so that it's a homomorphism. That it has to vanish on roots of unity. It agrees with the, the usual piatic logarithm on the one units, but we make the log of P be this number L. Okay? And the relationship is, I mean, this is not rocket science here, right? X is P to the N times the root of unity times something congruent to 1. So the log L of X is um, log P of X plus L ord P of X. Okay? The usual logarithm, you take L equals 0. That's sort of an arbitrary choice. And basically for reasons that uh, I probably will regret including this in the talk, epsilon of x is the somehow the cyclotomic character. Uh, in order to get the normalizations right, Broglie twists a lot of things by, by epsilon. And so that it'll appear, but it's, this is somehow not very significant. So. Um, we start by taking this space, O epsilon E of K. This is O of K. It's the functions on the piatic upper half plane with this K automorphy factor action that we looked at for several days, for the first three lectures. And we just modify the action of the center of the group a little bit in order to make, uh, I had always had the center of the group acting trivially, but in order to make this thing fit into the piatic Langland business, we, we change the way the center of the group acts to be a certain power of the cyclotomic character. And now what we do is we take elements of this space and we make a new space, O of 2 minus K. Oh, and what is E? E is some coefficient field. So the, the piatic upper half plane itself might be defined over QP. E is some finite extension field of QP. And we just take E-valued functions on the piatic upper half plane over QP. So that just lets us keep track of where the values of our function lie. So this space O of 2 minus K L E is the space that you get if you take rigid functions on the upper half plane and you integrate them formally, if you like, K minus 1 times. Okay? So in the weight 2 case, K minus 1 is 1. And you remember that on the upper half plane, if you look at O of 2, these are the um, this is the Duram cohomology. I mean, these are the one forms on the piatic upper half plane. And they're typically not exact. I mean, there's a huge Duram cohomology group. But the reason they're not exact is because of the residues on all the annuli. And if you remember, the residues on the annuli are these dz over z terms that come out from looking at the expansions of, the, of these rigid functions on each annulus. So what we're just going to do is we're, gonna in, we're just going to decree that the integral of dz over z is log L of z for a particularly chosen branch of the piatic logarithm. Now, we don't get a ri if we do this integral, we don't anymore get a rigid analytic function. In fact, I don't, even though there's been a lot of discussion of piatic analysis in this whole conference, this has not come up. I mean, this is not uh, a rigid analytic function in any of the, uh, in any of the models that have ar arisen. But it, it still somehow makes sense. I mean, the functions that you get look like they have a rigid part. And, if you in, I mean, and basically then, if you integrate k minus 1 times, you I remember that the basic affinoid domains are disks with holes cut in them. And you can only get log terms for the holes. And when you work this out, you find out that on any one of these sort of standard admissible opens in the upper half plane, you get a function which looks like a rigid function plus a finite sum of terms looking like you know, a power of z times the log L of z minus zi, where this is a point in the boundary. Okay, this comes about by integrating dz over z minus a, k minus 1 times. Okay? And even though these are not rigid analytic anymore, they still can be put together into a Bonnock space. And you still have a group action. I mean, the group action still works nicely. 
and you end up with the following exact sequence. So here we have these functions O, E of K. We integrate them K minus 1 times. The group action now goes back to 2 minus K. But we have to keep track of L. I mean, this space depends on L. And the kernel of this are the polynomials of degree K minus 2, because we took the K minus first derivative. This is just keeping track of the group action. Now, the Morita duality pairing for k bigger than or equal to 2 and even was between this space, which has no logarithms, and this space, which is the, these functions on the boundary, which had poles of a certain order and some group action. And uh, I've twisted it here by this character. So that you're supposed to remember from before. So what happens when you integrate this? Well, this space here, now you have sublogarithmic poles, so it gets bigger. Right? So what happens on this side? Well, what you get on the other side is you, you integrate back these functions. Now, they had poles at only at infinity. <laughs> okay, And you integrate them k minus 1 times, and you end up getting a term just at infinity that also involves the p-adic logarithm. Okay? So these are, the new, these are sort of the new boundary functions. They're, they're, this, they're locally analytic everywhere, except at infinity they have this logarithmic singularity of degree k minus 2, because you integrated 1 over z k minus 1 times. And you mod out, you take the space of those things, you give them a topology very similar to the topology that we put on the locally analytic functions, you mod out by the polynomials of degree k minus 2. So that's this sigma space. And this just describes the topology. The functions here, they, you, met, you, you look at a covering by balls, and away from infinity, they're just locally analytic. And on a ball around infinity, they have this logarithmic term plus a locally analytic part. And they have a direct limit topology. And the regular ones, the ones without the logarithmic poles, they're, they're in there sort of as just a subspace of finite index, finite co-dimension. So Broglie duality is between these antiderivatives of rigid analytic functions and these boundary functions which have uh, logarithmic singularities at infinity modulo polynomials of degree k minus 2. And to characterize this duality, uh, the, the characterization is if you're, so I have to give you a pairing between one of these integrated rigid functions and one of these locally analytic functions with logarithmic singularities. And basically, the characterizing property is that. So you remember that the, the Poisson integral was integral 1 over z minus x. That was how we recovered a rigid function from its boundary distribution. And you basically just integrate that relation. So this function here, which is the is function of, for fixed z in the upper half plane, let's say, and x, the boundary value variable, if you pair this function for fixed z against one of these g's, which is a function on the upper half plane, you recover the value of g at z. So this is like the Dirac distribution at z, at, at the point z, if you like. And um, so the, uh, I mean, there's some other characterizing properties. Basically, this relates Broglie duality to Morita duality. Essentially, if you happen to pick a function, let's say, in this space, which turns out not to have any logarithmic poles, then the pairing, instead of taking the pairing with respect to the Broglie pairing, you take the k minus first derivative of your function. Uh, oh, sorry, the other way around. If g happens to have no log terms, OK, by chance, maybe because when you integrated it, it had no residues, then if you want to compute the Broglie pairing, instead what you do is you take the k minus first derivative of f, which will eliminate its logarithmic singularities, and you take the Morita pairing. You have to keep track of the signs here. I'm almost certain that I've messed it up somehow. But up to sign, these are the characterizing properties. And similarly, if you do this on the rigid, on the locally analytic side, if your function happens to have no lo on the boundary happens to have no logarithmic singularities, and you want to pair it, then you take the k minus first derivative of the function on the upper half plane, which kills the log terms, and then take the pairing. So this is a generalization of this Morita pairing. And here's the picture. So the functions here on the boundary get paired. This is the original pairing. They get paired with the rigid functions. If you integrate those, you introduce logarithmic poles at infinity. And here, if you integrate these, you introduce logarithmic poles on the residues, and they pair. 
And inside here, you have the polynomials of degree k minus 2, which is the kernel of differentiation. And here, you have just the logarithmic part at infinity. That's what's in here. These have logs at infinity, but these don't. Here, and, and it turns out that that can be identified with the dual of this space. And that's just a finite dimensional term. So this is an extension of Morita duality. So what do you do? Well, you take, you remember that inside the uh, functions of weight k on the upper half plane, we had the one, we had the residue map to harmonic cocycles, and inside there we had bounded ones. And um, these harmonic ones were dual to the locally algebraic functions. The bounded harmonic cocycles were dual to a completion of the locally algebraic ones, which might have just been the continuous function. So that's the fact in case. When k is 2, this completion of the harmonic cocycles is the dual to the continuous functions on p1. Now we need to back up. We need to integrate this back to the one that has l in it. So we define what boundedness is. These are our things that have logarithmic poles at infinity and are locally analytic. We say something's bounded if when you, no matter how you translate f, it's still, so f is your, uh, um, this is the Broglie pairing. You basically, by duality, say that something is bounded if it gives a bounded linear form. This is not expressed very well. Maybe I'll just say, you can identify in here a certain space of bounded functions uh, insi inside the, um, once you integrate, you can still have a notion of boundedness. I think this slide is more or less incomprehensible. At least it's incomprehensible to me, which is not a good sign as far as you guys are concerned. So um, let's just say that just like we had the, one, the functions on the upper half plane whose, cosi whose uh, residues were bounded, gave us bounded functions on the upper half plane, you can also identify a bounded space of functions in here, at least formally, although it could be zero. Finding such bounded functions is an interesting problem. And the differentiation map is such that um, if you take the bounded guys with logarithmic poles and take their derivatives, that turns out to give you a closed subspace. Well, could be the whole space, could be zero, but some subspace here. And then to get the corresponding thing on the distribution side, you dualize them. So you, take, you get a Bonhoeff space, which is the continuous dual of this bounded space of functions on the upper half plane, which have logarithmic singularities. And since you don't know for sure that there are any bounded things, you don't know that this thing is non-zero. And that was sort of the problem that Broy faced. I mean, you can make these definitions, but you can't prove anything about them, at least at first. Here's what you should think about. B of k, which is the dual of O of k, is some big space. When you put in L, you get quotients of this Banach space B of k parametrized by the L invariant. Somehow in the Langlands picture, B of k is just a piece of the, it just somehow is the information about the, that comes from the classical picture, the Hodge weights and the um, Probanius. And then when you pick an L invariant, you get an irreducible quotient of this big representation. So now we have to put the L invariant into the picture. So we have to look at this exact sequence. This is, first of all, here's our functions on the upper half plane. And here's our things that we got by integrating them. And here's the kernel. So this map from here to here is the derivative. And we take hom of d0 into that space. And we get this exact sequence. And we're going to fix a modular form. And we're going to take gamma naught pn cohomology of this sequence. So now we're mixing, once again, the, the modular symbols and the rigid analytic geometry. So we take the invariants and we get this exact sequence here. We also take the f heck apart of this. So um, just as a remark, pk minus 2 and its dual are isomorphic as representations. There aren't any invariants in here, it turns out. So we actually are looking at this piece of the exact sequence. This space here um, is just a space of modular symbols. So we have here somehow the, um, these things that we got by integrating, modular symbols with values in that. Here we have the thing that we looked at before, modular symbols with values and functions on the upper half plane. And here we have some finite dimensional space of modular symbols. 
So the first thing that you prove is that in this map from here to here, instead of taking all of these functions, you can just take the bounded ones. And that's good, because the bounded ones are the ones which are related to these Banach spaces. Why is that true? Well, um, it's true because the uh, basic, let's look at the case, forget, let's just forget this one for the moment and just look at the space where we're back in the case of the earlier lectures. We have no logarithmic singularity. This space of, of modular symbols maxed by the residue map to some, we replace these functions by their, their residues, their harmonic co-cycles. And this space here, this is one of these measures, sorry, this is one of these modular symbols with values in harmonic co-cycles, which are invariant by this big group. And the action of this big group is so large on the edges that as we saw before, you actually are more or less determined here by your value on a single edge. And that fact allows you to reduce this whole space to something finite dimensional. And therefore, the possible things that you can have for the values of this on edges are translates of the values on some finite space of edges and so forth. You get a, a bounded harmonic cosine. So if these things are bounded, sorry, if these are bounded here, you can reverse this arrow by integrating that. So here's the theorem. You remember we had a, in that, in that cohomology group sequence, we were going here from the modular symbols with values in the functions on the upper half plane. We had this map coming from the derivative, and we mapped into here. And the claim is this boundary map is 0 only when the L, which is in the space that's preceding this space. It's the, so remember, we say that we're going to integrate 1 over z and get log L. This map turns out to be 0 exactly when the L that we chose is the Orton L invariant that I defined in the previous lecture. So to go back to the exact sequence here, this map here is 0 only when this L is chosen to be the Darmon Orton L, uh, up to sign. So I can just compute this boundary map. Maybe it'll give you some idea of why this might be true, because it's not very complicated. How do you compute the boundary map? Well, you start with a function in, uh, from the modular symbols into this space of uh, rigid analytic functions, and you integrate it. So here's our exact sequence, just to remind you. This is the derivative. So we want to compute this boundary map. So we take something here, and we integrate it back. And then we try to make it gamma naught of pn invariant, OK? So we take our function, and we integrate it back, and we hope that this boundary, which comes from the group action, is actually 0. I mean, that's what we want to know. This is the obstruction to integrating it back and getting something gamma invariant. So we have to compute this thing. And we happen to know that it's a polynomial of degree k minus 2. So we take our rigid function f, and we just look at its Taylor series at a point, because that is going to be this polynomial, right? I mean, if we only, that's, that's the, this thing, the thing, the polynomial that you're getting is the, uh, basically the initial terms of the Taylor expansion of the polynomial. So now we can write this boundary, this boundary map in terms of the Taylor, initial part of the Taylor expansion of the function f at a point in the upper half plane. And this looks bad because we have gammas in two variables. But we modify it by a co-boundary, and we get that the boundary map is the difference between taking the Taylor expansion at the point gamma a and the Taylor expansion at the point a and seeing if they're equal. This is, seems very mysterious, but the idea is the following. We have this modular form, OK? And the, we have this group acting on it. And we want to integrate the modular form and find out if the integral can again be made invariant. Well, you integrate the function back, OK? And now there's an undetermined constant. And you apply the group action. And you see whether uh, you can adjust your constants to make the integral again invariant. OK, so in some sense, this is just calculus. And uh, so this is the failure of this constant of integration to actually be invariant. Now you plug that into Broy duality. So you remember. This is a reproducing kernel for Broy duality. It evaluates this. M is the modular symbol, but it doesn't really play any role in this. It evaluates our Taylor polynomial at, at z. I should have used a different letter, probably, for the z here and the z here. But so if you work out the Taylor expansion of f 
using this reproducing kernel, what you find is that, in fact, the polynomial, t here is now the, the, polyn the variable in the Taylor expansion. I mean, it's somehow another version of z. It's just this polynomial in t, whose coefficients are polynomials, whose coefficients are functions in this space that have logarithmic singularities at infinity, paired under Broglie duality with this function that we started with. So here's our boundary map. We're supposed to take this thing for gamma a and subtract it again for a. So what happens? All that the only place a appears is here. Okay? And when you subtract it for gamma a minus a, you get log of gamma a minus x over a minus x. I mean, the logarithm is still a logarithm. And so the obstruction to that integral working is this pairing, this Broy pairing. But remember now, this function here no longer has any logarithmic singularities at infinity, because a is in the upper half plane. So gamma a minus x over a minus x is now a perfectly good analytic function on the boundary. So it's dropped into the subspace of functions on the boundary with no logarithmic singularities. If you expand it out, you see that it's got these I mean, it, as, a, as a polynomial in t here, the coefficients are these pairings, where you have some binomial coefficients and so forth. And so you have here a polynomial in t. And now, to finally unravel all of this, you need to relate this thing to the, to the L invariant, which, just to remind you, compared the, uh, basically compared the integral of something like this against the p-adic logarithm with the integral of something like this, but instead of the p-adic logarithm, you had the ORD. So that the L invariant was de defined by taking the basically, well, let me just say, if we take this, let me finish the argument here, and then I'll make the connection. So you sort through all of this, and you see these coefficients here, and they look like this. And this is the Broglie pairing. But this guy has no logarithmic singularity, so it reduces to the Morita pairing, where now you take the derivative of this thing. Well, how did you make f in the first place? You s integrated something. So now this thing here is the function that you started with. And this thing here is this x to the i log l gamma a minus x over a minus x. How was the Orton L invariant defined? It was defined by doing two integrals. First, computing the Morita pairing with log p and then computing the Morita pairing with Ord and asking what, how are those two things related. And so let's just write log L as log P plus L Ord P and stick it in there. Okay? And what you get is first a sum, which is the integral of log P, which was the first thing that you did for the Orton L invariant, first integral you did, plus L times the second thing that you did for the Orton L invariant, and the definition of the ordinal invariant was, well, it was the number that, such that those, the integral with respect to log equaled the ordinal L invariant times the integral with respect to ord. So if L happens to be minus the ordinal L invariant, this is 0. That's more or less the definition of the ordinal L invariant. And this being 0 means this boundary map is 0. So the L invariant arises naturally from the boundary map of that cohomology exact sequence. And I'm going to go over by a few, few minutes, but just a couple, and I apologize for that. So now we have to go back to the connection to piatic Langlands. If you remember the exact sequence, we went through all this trouble to compute this boundary map. What we've done is we have managed to embed this thing here. We've gotten a non-zero map from this into here, because we've, we've got this boundary map to be zero. And uh, so what Broglie's theorem with regard to piatic Langlands says is that you can embed this b2 two, 2 minus kl space, this is this completion of the space of functions with logarithmic poles at infinity, into this space of piatic modular forms, up to a little twist by a sign, precisely when that boundary map was 0, which is to say precisely when your L invariant is equal to. Now, uh, I cheated. There are really two of these L invariants, L plus or minus, because the in the definition, there were you could have used either the plus modular symbols or the minus modular symbols. Broglie actually proves they're equal. So I cheated there, and I just say whether or not b2 
the L, this L invariance happens to be equal to the L invariance of this modular form. So in other words, and the reason for that is that the dual of this, I mean, you apply this duality theorem. The dual of this D2K minus L, D star, are these rigid functions on the upper half plane. And so the right-hand side of Broglie's theorem are the modular symbols with values in these spaces on the p-adic upper half plane. And we just said that space is non-zero precisely when L is chosen to be LF. And so this embeds un precisely under those conditions. So the moral is that in this interpretation, you do sort of have an automorphic interpretation of the L invariant. The L invariant of F is the parameter which determines the local component of this big global p-adic automorphic representation for that form F. OK, that's the end. Yeah, so that's what the, that's the fontaine maser L invariant. And the, the picture is you have this, uh, so you take your Galois representation and you pass to the Fontaine module that's associated to it. And um, you get, it's a potential, it's a semi-stable representation. So it, you get a vector space which has um, a filtration on it and then also two operators, a Frobenius and this monodromy operator. And so uh, the L invariant sort of tells you the, the relationship between these three. I mean, you have sort of three. Well, the filtration gives you sort of one one-dimensional subspace of your two-dimensional vector space. And your N operator gives you another one-dimensional subspace of your two-dimensional vector space. And your F gives you a kind of a choice of basis using the Hodge filtration. So you express the coordinates of these things, and, and you get the L invariant. I mean, I just have to think about exactly what this is. But that's right, basically, right? Anyway, yeah, so the answer is yes. Although, it, I mean, c if I give you the, I mean, it, it's, a, it's an easy thing to do if you're looking at Fontaine modules. I mean, to extract it from the sort of raw data of the Piatic Galois representation, um, you know, it's not an obvious thing, except in weight two. Right, in weight two, you have an, or then it's an ordinary representation, and you're looking at the action on the Galois group Sorry, on the tape on the tape module of a tate elliptic curve, and um, so if if you think about the that, then it, everything is completely explicit, and you find out that the uh, you know that you s the the L invariant is then this log of Q over ord of Q invariant. Uh, I mean, you can s that you can extract that just from the Galois.